The race for Denver mayor slims down by almost half. 29 potential candidates to 17 likely on your ballot. Tonight on Next, former Mayor Wellington Webb makes his endorsement in the race, saying it was an easier choice than last time. Despite the fact that there are 17 people on, on the ballot? This was an easier decision. Democrats unveil their ban on so-called assault weapons with a major change. There are people who have the power to bring down your Excel bill. Marshall is taking your questions straight to them. We're beginning to understand the environmental damage of the incident that led the state's only refinery to shut down temporarily. And a congressman from Colorado calls for a nationwide ban on TikTok. Get it off all our phones. There's still no government ban on next. So here we go. There are smart folks who will tell you that the most powerful person in Colorado is actually the mayor of Denver seeing how the governor often has to follow the state legislature on some issues. And tonight, the race for Denver mayor is down to a very manageable 17 candidates on your ballot from potential 29. I mean, look how spacious our graphic is now. There wasn't a single well-known name that did not make the ballot due to a failure to collect petition signatures. State Rep Alex Valdez is the biggest name to drop out. The candidates on the ballot run the gamut from staunchly progressive to one Republican running in deep blue Denver. We're finalizing details for one very large debate on Nine News next month. One of Denver's most prominent Democrats, former Mayor Wellington Webb, is making an early endorsement in this crowded race, announcing his decision first here on Next. Webb led the city from 1991 to 2003, and he's continued to hold sway in Democratic circles ever since. Webb supported Michael Hancock in the open race in 2011. Hancock's declining popularity means that it's unlikely that he's going to be a sought-after endorsement in the race for mayor, and that makes former Mayor Webb's endorsement one of the few that might move the needle for voters. And tonight he's endorsing State Representative Leslie Harrod. Because I think the city needs um, a new generation of leadership, a new generation of, that brings fresh ideas, that brings fresh energy, that uh, has the ability to connect with all segments of the population. For me, having this um, this endorsement means that I have a partner in this work because the city is facing some of the toughest challenges that we've seen. Um, they were facing some pretty tough challenges when, when uh, Webb was in office as well, and we're going to have to do that together. I want to ask you about that idea of, of status quo yeah. because, obviously, you led the city for 12 years. Yeah. You endorsed Michael Hancock. He's led the city for 12 years. So I can see critics saying, that your endorsement is essentially an endorsement of the status quo because of the long time that you led the city and then Mayor Hancock led the city. My decision is only that I support people and it's up to them to run and take their case to the people and then to let the people decide. Despite the fact that you supported Mayor Hancock, do you think the city needs a change in direction? Yes. Yeah. Our conversation with former Mayor Webb on whether Denver is currently a city in decline and also his view on a mayor's relationship with powerful developers. We'll have that portion of our discussion in just a moment. Denver is preparing to phase out its last rec center that's providing emergency shelter for migrants coming up from the southern border. But now it appears that cold weather may delay those plans. An email sent to shelter staff and volunteers earlier this week alerted them that the only remaining rec center shelter could be closed as early as the end of the week and that migrants staying there would be offered somewhere else to stay. Now the city's saying that it's watching potential sub-freezing temperatures this week and next. The city's been transitioning migrants out of these emergency rec center shelters for a few weeks now. They've been able to do that because the number of new arrivals each day continues to drop. Today, the city reported that there are only 96 migrants left in the city's emergency shelters. There are another 834 migrants staying in partner agency shelters throughout Denver. Democrats at the state capitol are preparing to introduce a bill that would ban the sale, manufacture, and transfer of so-called assault weapons. Could be one of the most controversial issues up for discussion this year. It's a scaled-back bill from an earlier leaked draft, which would also ban possession of those guns. The bill, sponsored by Democratic State Reps Andrew Besnecker and Elizabeth Epps, loosely defines assault weapons as any firearm that can fire a high volume of ammunition accurately or can be modified to do that. So that would include semi-automatic rifles with detachable magazines and other modifications, as well as semi-automatic pistols that meet certain parameters. The proposal would ban the sale of those weapons, with exceptions for law enforcement officers and military service members. 
It is not clear that Democratic Governor Jared Polis is on board on this. When we ask him about it, he pivots to talking about other actions on guns, like expanding red flag laws. We specifically, looking at the data, uh, believe that extreme risk protection order can work better. I do think, as a nation, we need to do more. There's limits to what states can do. The bill has not been formally introduced, and already the, the No Compromises Gun Rights Group, Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, is saying that it's raising money so they can sue. So we asked, and you overwhelmingly told us, that you want to know more about why Excel bills are so high and what can be done about it. Today, the state regulators who oversee Excel held a meeting specifically about expensive bills. We've been explaining some of the why. The price of natural gas is higher than last year, and our usage is likely up because it's been colder. Our Marshal Zellinger had an opportunity to take some of your questions directly to the regulatory staff. Susan in Denver writes, I want to express my concern with Excel's rate hikes. Excel is currently reporting record profits. That is Erin O'Neill. She is the chief economist for Colorado's PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, which regulates companies like Excel. I took your questions to her following a PUC meeting this morning where she helped present why your utility bills are so high. Gas prices are about 40 percent higher. This, this year than they were last year. Natural gas is purchased by Excel, and that cost is passed down to us, dollar for dollar. At what point can the PUC say, that was a bad business decision, you have to eat the cost for that. Like, you should have planned better. I know it's dollar for dollar, not this time. If the you know, commission staff found a problem and felt like there was something the utilities were doing that was not prudent, they would bring that to the commission and say, we need a prudence review, we want to look at these costs. Um, that is very rare. O'Neill said that utility companies like Excel provide the PUC a gas purchase plan, explaining how much gas they plan to buy long term, how much they plan to buy daily, and how much they plan to store. Then that gets compared after the fact with a gas purchase report to see how that all went. We do review those in pretty close detail, um, and I've never seen like a disconnect between what public service purchases at and the market price or something like that. One of the most popular questions we got is about Excel profits. Through three quarters of 2022, Excel had ongoing earnings of almost $650 million. It's a topic one of the PUC commissioners brought up in this morning's meeting. One of the missing links in your presentation was let, what's the historic record on Excel's profits and dividends and stock buybacks. <laughs> well, when commissioners exactly. like John Gavin approve the rates we pay Excel, it turns out we're not just paying them back for what they call investments, like transmission lines or a new power plant. We're also paying them extra for profit. There are things that the commission says, no, that's not a cost that you're going to recover from Colorado ratepayers, or that's a cost that will be shared between ratepayers and shareholders, things like equity compensation for executives. We review those costs to determine how much of those can be recovered from Colorado ratepayers. Yes, part of your bill pays the executive salaries. I also asked if the PUC ever said no to a rate increase. The short answer is not really. The long answer is rate increases include a lot of line items, and so the PUC can say no or reduce certain parts of the request. But overall, a rate increase has only been denied apparently one time in the last five years. And I mean, there's negotiation involved in it. It's like going to your parents for an allowance. You say, I'd like 100 bucks a week. They say, we'll give you 20. And you think to yourself, whoo, I would have been happy with 10. Exactly. I heard that from someone who's well-versed in energy policy, uh, that that's like the backdoor way that we still got what we want, but the public thinks we took a, took a shot somewhere. Uh, I know we got a lot of questions about, like, what can you do? There's a consumer advocacy agency that you can reach out to. You can email the PUC. We'll put some of those links on uh, 9news.com. And... Their annual report comes out tomorrow. So guess what I'll be doing tomorrow? Marshall, the people have spoken. They're not done with this. They want, they want you to keep up the questions, keep up the pressure to get them the answers they want. So we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Marshall. So let's meet these commissioners. Let's meet these regulators. So first you should know, they are appointed by each governor. Democratic Governor Jared Polis is appointed too. John Gavan is the only holdover from the Hickenlooper administration, another Democratic administration. His term expires this month, so he's out the door. He's a Navy vet from West, Western Colorado. He spent most of his career in technology and served on the board for some power suppliers in Colorado and the D.C. area. Governor Polis appointed Commissioner Megan Gilman in March of 2022, so she's on the PUC through next January. She's a small business owner, served on the board for Holy Cross Energy, and worked on analyzing rates for customers. Eric Blank is the newest commissioner. His term expires January of 2025. He's a lawyer, an economist. He also founded a renewable energy development company. He says he's worked on clean energy issues for more than 35 years. So you want to know who's got the control over uh, Excel? 
It's those folks. And then there is the incoming commissioner, the replacement for Gavon. It's Tom Plant. He's from Buena Vista, comes in next month. Former Democratic state legislator who also served as director of the governor's energy office from 2007 to 2011. An overwhelming number of women in abusive relationships report that their abuser has also hurt their pet. There are few domestic violence shelters in our area that are set up to also take in pets. And that's one reason why Gateway Shelter often gets calls from help outside the area they primarily serve in Aurora and Arapahoe County. And it's why this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign supports Gateway Domestic Violence Services as they work to keep adults and children and pets safe from abuse. Gateway is a place where families find immediate safety from abusive situations, a place where children can get mental health support, where partners escaping violence receive long-term counseling and somebody to walk alongside them through the justice process. And lastly, as we mentioned, it's a place where family pets are safe too. The nonprofit offers all those services in English and in Spanish for free. A few weeks ago, we learned the latest numbers on domestic violence deaths in Colorado. 91 deaths in 2021, the most in any year since the state started a new form of reporting them in 2017. Case by case, Colorado by Colorado, and day by day, Gateway is out there saving lives. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, and I'll send you that link to donate. Your $10 million in microgiving certainly proves that $5 donations add up fast. So as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of five bucks to get us started. Gateway, the people there are going to be there today and tonight and tomorrow, whenever there is a family that needs to escape violence. And when they should ask tentatively, well, what should we do with our pets? They're told, bring them along. You'll all be safe and together. A Colorado congressman says viral dance videos are a threat to American national security at least if they're on TikTok. He wants it banned from all our phones. And former Mayor Wellington Webb was not a fan of my question on whether he still knows what's best for Denver 20 years after he left office. More of our conversation next. The Suncor Refinery in Commerce City admits that it dumped a carcinogen into Sand Creek in the days following its shutdown in December. In early January, Suncor filed a notice with the state health department that benzene levels in Sand Creek exceeded what was allowed by the state. Benzene is a chemical found in crude oil and gas, and it's been linked to cancer and blood diseases. Suncor is allowed to release a small amount of benzene into Sand Creek, but they told the state that excess amounts got into the water following a fire at the refinery on Christmas Eve. Regulators say that Suncor's own testing now shows benzene levels are back below the legal threshold. And the state is saying they don't think that there's a threat to public health. Colorado Republican Representative Ken Buck is now leading the conservative men movement to ban TikTok in the U.S., like, like ban it from all of our phones, not just from government devices. Yeah. Buck, along with Missouri Republican Senator Josh Hawley, have introduced a proposal to ban that Chinese-owned app from being downloaded on any device in America. They say that TikTok is a national security threat. They say the Chinese Communist Party is using it to spy on Americans. Buck and Hawley's bill also seeks to ban any kind of commercial activity with TikTok's parent company and force an investigation into the app. A more limited version of their bill, which bans TikTok on some government devices, already passed last year. A quick check of your forecast as we are getting ready for some snow to the north and to the east. Rabbit Ears Pass and, of course, Rocky Mountain National Park. Anywhere between 8 to 16 inches possible gusts up to 60 miles per hour. And what you'll notice with this forecast is the snow is going to be staying just to the north and to the west of the Denver metro region. Into the high country becoming heavy at times through Thursday night, even into Friday morning through Friday evening. Very consistent snowfall, so it's not going to be one of those systems that dumps a whole lot of snow in a very short amount of time. We're talking about 36 to 48 hours of consistent snowfall. And that's going to result in anywhere between 9 to 12 inches in Steamboat Springs. Of course, Rocky Mountain National Park could be getting a little bit more than that. Anywhere between 10 to 16 inches possible out there. Winter Park and Vail, 4 and a half inches of snow. Quick check of lows tonight. Temperatures dropping back down into the teens. High temperatures for tomorrow, middle to upper 30s. Seven-day forecast. Temperatures are going to be back in the 40s. Not for too long, though. Another round of snow on Saturday and on Sunday. And temperatures plummet into the teens on Monday. Former Mayor Wellington Webb has a warning for the next mayor of Denver. Once you get elected, everybody telling you you're my friend. They're not your friend. They're a business associate. His thoughts on the power of developers 
and whether Denver is in decline. Next. Former Mayor Wellington Webb is warning the 17 people on the ballot for mayor of Denver that they ought to beware of newfound friends if they take office. That's where we pick up our extended conversation. Once you get elected and everybody telling you you're my friend, they're not your friend. They're a business associate. Do you think that Denver is a city in decline right now? No, I think Denver is a city that's on the, uh, let's see, what do we say in astrology? On the cusp. What do you mean? I mean, I think the city could go either way. I think the city could go either way. And I think it's important that we push it, that we want the best of us to lead the rest of us. We need somebody that's going to be willing to stand up to big business, to work with them, to make life easier for them so they don't have to work, work, wait three or four years for a permit, but to also say that I represent, as mayor, the taxpayers of Denver. I don't represent you as a developer. I work with you to develop if it's a fair deal. The city's changed a lot since you left office 20 years ago. I mean, it's grown in population by 25%. How confident are you that you still know what the city needs, considering how much time has passed and how much the city has changed since you left office? That question makes about as much sense as asking Kobe Bryant, does he know how to play, did he know how to play basketball? So, yeah, I know the city. I know every neighborhood in the city. I eat on the north side, I eat on the west side. I live in the northeast side. I know, I've been in every neighborhood in this city. See, I love cities, that's, that's, that's what I do. In 1991, Webb came from far behind in a field of about a half dozen candidates to make the runoff and win. He told me he's not concerned about 17 candidates for mayor. He says the best candidates in campaigns are always going to be able to connect with voters. He said he'd be a lot more worried if there were only two candidates. My full conversation with former Mayor Webb, along with the candidate that he's endorsing for mayor, Leslie Herod, is on the next YouTube page. We're back with your feedback and a chance to talk about the domestic violence shelter that you're helping as it protects people and pets. Next. Colorado lost more people to domestic violence in 2021, last year that we have stats for, than any time since 2016. There are a lot of dedicated people and nonprofits working to save lives. Gateway Domestic Violence Services in Arapaho County is special because they protect people in need of escape from abusive situations, men, women, children, and they also have space for their pets. Not many shelters can offer that. We know that abusers often target animals as well as people and that some folks fleeing violence worry about leaving their beloved pets behind. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get that link to join me in supporting Gateway's work. They're in it for the long haul beside these families, beyond just shelter to mental health support and guidance through the legal process. Anonymous feedback via text tonight saying, take your word of thanks roadshow and sanctimonious news coverage somewhere else. You truly suck as a journalist. I'll tell you what, uh, I do plan to stay at this as long as we can because it's really clear the amount of good that next viewers are able to do in our community. And the nice little side benefit is how angry it makes that one guy. We'll see you next time.